it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. We're yeah, supposed it was another era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. A very good afternoon to you and welcome to the show. I'm Vanessa Feltz and this is what's coming up. Up in smoke, Rishi Sunak faces yet another Tory rebellion over his bold plan to ban smoking, with a handful of cabinet ministers considering voting it down tonight. Plus, are we heading for a world war? Israel's war cabinet meets for the third day in a row as they consider how to retaliate to Iran's unprecedented attack on its territory. And later in the show, I'll be joined by Boy's Own star Keith Duffy to find out why a new book written for adults with learning disabilities is so very close to his heart. First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Natalia Hojera. Good afternoon. Israel's war cabinet is expected to meet again today to discuss its retaliation to Iran's drone and missile attacks. Rishi Sunak is hoping to speak to Benjamin Netanyahu this afternoon to urge restraint, though local media are reporting that the Israeli Prime Minister is refusing to take calls from world leaders. Conservative MP and former army officer James Sunderland says the UK should be trying to ease tensions in the region. Whether or not Israel retaliates, whether or not Israel attacks Iran is absolutely a matter for Israel. And I believe that the US government and the British government are quite right in saying publicly that they would not join that. We need to de-escalate tension right now. We need to contain the crisis, not exacerbate it. Nobody wants World War III. Donald Trump has told reporters he should be out campaigning. Instead, the former US president has arrived at court for day two of his criminal trial, where jury selection remains underway. Trump's been accused of falsifying business records to hide payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels, allegations he again denied today. Every legal pundit, every legal scholar said this trial is a disgrace. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. But this is a trial that should never happen. It should have been thrown out a long time ago. Despite Trump's legal battles, Liz Truss has told Talk TV she wants to see him become president again. Will the world be a safer place uh, after November the 5th this year with President Trump? Uh, in the, back in the Oval Office or President Biden remaining there? It will be safer with President Trump. Why? And I hope he gets elected. The mayor of Brussels has shut down a national conservatism conference that Nigel Farage was speaking at. According to local reports, the former UKIP leader was finishing a speech at the event when police arrived. Emir Keir, the mayor of Brussels, said he had issued an order banning the conference to guarantee public safety, adding that the far right is not welcome in the city. A Muslim student has lost her legal challenge against a school prayer ban. Michaela School in London, which was previously dubbed Britain's strictest school, was taken to court over the policy, which was said to be discriminatory. The school's founder and head teacher, Catherine Burbell Singh, said the ruling was a victory for all schools and that institutions should be free to do what is right for the pupils it serves. MPs are currently debating legislation designed to give the UK some of the strictest smoking laws in the world. Rishi Sunak wants to make Generation Alpha, born since 2009, the UK's first smoke-free generation, with anyone turning 15 from this year banned from buying cigarettes. But many Conservative MPs are expected to rebel against the plans. 
The first product from Meghan Markle's new business venture has been revealed. The Duchess of Sussex has sent out jars of strawberry jam to friends and influencers from her American company, American Riviera Orchard. Fashion designer Tracy Robbins and Argentine socialite Delfina Balquier are among those to post pictures of the spread online. Aside from the photos, very little has been released about Meghan's new project, which was launched last month. That's all from me. Time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it was rather windy over the last couple of days. It's still looking blustery for today with some showers about. Fairly cloudy as well, but not as windy as it was yesterday. And eventually, the winds will calm down as we head into the weekend and high pressure takes over. But before then, still quite a blustery day and a cool northerly airflow. So despite the sunshine, it is still going to feel quite nippy out there. And there will be some showers in between the sunny spells. Some of them could be heavy and thundery with the risk of hail, especially around parts of the Midlands, eastern and southeastern England. Temperature-wise, around average for the time of year, 12 to 15 degrees Celsius. Not feeling that mild in the sunshine, though, with those northerly winds. Then overnight the brisk winds continue. Showers will also continue around parts of the northeast of Scotland, eastern areas of England and some out towards the west but many of the inland ones will die away. With the brisk winds it should be a mostly frost free night but there will be a patchy frost I think in some rural areas especially for Scotland. And then for tomorrow lots of sunshine and dry weather to begin the day but into the afternoon showers become more widespread once again especially around northern and eastern parts of the UK and at the same time Ireland and Northern Ireland will become cloudier with showery spells of rain later spreading to parts of the west of Scotland. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Natalia and to Nazanin. Let's move directly now to our top story. Rishi Sunak's facing a potential Tory rebellion over his controversial plan to ban smoking, with dozens of his own MPs expected to vote against the ban. The Prime Minister's landmark tobacco and vapes bill, which aims to make it an offence to sell tobacco products to anyone born after 2009, will be put to the Commons this evening. Conservatives have been granted a rare free vote on the legislation, which means they are allowed to oppose it without being punished for that. It's understood that a handful of cabinet ministers, including Kemi Badenoch, will not support it, but it's still likely to pass because it has backing from the Labour Party. The Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, kicked off the debate in the Commons earlier. For a moment, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like us to imagine that we're not in this historic and magnificent chamber, but we are instead standing at the entrance of a local hospital. A patient comes through the doors, struggling to breathe. Smoking sent their asthma spiralling out of control. A minute later, another patient passes by. Smoking caused the heart disease they're battling. A minute later, another person comes in, and then another. This vicious cycle repeats itself nearly every minute of every day in our national health system. Because here in the United Kingdom, Almost one hospital admission a minute is the human cost of smoking. Joining me in the studio now, Hugo Rifkin, a columnist at The Times and former advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley. Nice to see you both. And down the line, Aubrey Allegretti, chief political correspondent at The Times. Good to have you all on board. So let's, let's start with Hugo. Let's talk about libertarianism, conservatism and the right to give yourself lung cancer by smoking if that's what you choose to do. Because that's what this is all about, isn't it? The right to make appalling decisions for ourselves as adults if we so choose. Absolutely. It's slightly come out of nowhere, this, in that this government at this stage are bringing in this, um, uh, this, the, the, this law on smoking that is, um, is quite an advanced law. It will be, there aren't really many other laws like it anywhere in the world. There was one in New Zealand, but it's kind of passed. The fact that... Oh, we've lost your mic, so we'll oh, bring that I'm back sorry. in and we'll talk to Charlie while we fix it, fix it up. Charlie, um, <laughs> this is very much, isn't it, pertinent to and pertains to the core of what conservatism is. Mm. And Liz Truss, we're going to talk about her in a minute, you can barely avoid talking about her, she's everywhere promoting her new book, but one of the things that she says about smoking is it's not conservative to ban it. So 
what, what, what is this essence of conservatism that, that we're talking about here? So I think she's um, uh, basically knocking on the door of the freedom, uh, individual freedoms to uh, choose. So, you know, people uh, are allowed to have a little tipple at night if they fancy a little drink or even during the day if they fancy it. Um, uh, but you can smoke, uh, you can eat as much chocolate as you desire. But it's about individual choice and individual freedoms. But it's also about individual responsibility. So if people choose to smoke, that is something that they should be able to do. Smoking has been around for uh, a long time. That's the argument Liz is putting forward. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what she's suggesting is that it's... The, the law itself is a bit complicated because after 2009, there's obviously going to be an incremental increase of people who, you know, I could, well, I'm 34 on Thursday, but, you know, um, uh, uh, Hugo uh, could be 33, it looks it. Um, uh, <laughs> but, but at some point, I would be able to buy a packet of cigarettes and, 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 and you wouldn't, which is um, uh, just a bit of a complication for the shopkeeper. For the I mean, let's just talk about how this law will work, should it be uh, implemented. And that is, if you're born after 2009, it will never be legal, however old you are, even when you're 50 or 70 or 83, it will never be legal for you to buy cigarettes. So should you arrive at the corner shop waving your money, they would say, show us your passport, and it will show that you're 82, and they'd say, no, you're not allowed to have them, and that's it. A good way of understanding, I have, I have two daughters, one of whom is 15 and one of whom is 12, uh, which means that, God forbid, either of them should smoke. By the time they're 80, the older one will still be buying the cigarettes for the younger one. It's <laughs> so this does seem weird, but actually, if we are going to ban cigarettes, and obviously this is a debate about banning cigarettes, this is much better than just banning them tomorrow. You know, it's, it's a big deal to ban them. If you ban them tomorrow, you have a huge black market, you have a lot of people whose lives are uprooted, you have, I mean, you, you, you'll have people pushed, on, pushed towards drink and drugs and all the rest of it. If the idea is genuinely to ban cigarettes, this is a pretty smart way of doing it. All right, let's bring Aubrey Allegretti in on this. Aubrey, your take on the essence of conservatism and how it is that, I mean, we imagine sort of semi-sane adults might well vote in favour of smoking when all we've been told for years and years is how incredibly dangerous it is, what it does to unborn babies in the womb, what it does to your lungs, what it does in every other way to kind of thwart your health. And we always keep talking about the cost of the NHS and how expensive it is, and it's much too expensive, and yet it it is likely that Conservatives particularly will vote against um, a bill that will ultimately ban smoking. I think this goes to a bigger rupture in the Conservative Party, really, than just about smoking. There are certainly MPs who look at this and go, in isolation, this is frustrating because we don't feel like it's the sort of policy that a Conservative government, almost with a policy, should be approaching. But they think it's slightly more emblematic of the issues and the problems with the Conservative Party more broadly, moving to sort of ban things and, and moving to the kind of nanny, nanny state territory that they often uh, criticise and accuse the Labour Party of. So I think this is typifying a, a wider issue for some Conservative MPs. The good news for Rishi Sunak is that they're likely to be relatively small in number. So a few dozen, there will probably be some cabinet ministers who either vote against it or abstain. We've heard about Kemi, Kemi Badnock's concerns. Penny Morden is also reported to have done. But in 2006, the Labour government um, suffered you know, a significant rebellion with even someone like the Deputy Prime Minister uh, rebelling when Tony Blair tried to bring in smoking reforms, significant ones back then. So I think it'll be uh, a small sort of frustration to number 10, but not really anything too worrying for this. All right, let's bring Charlie. Charlie's nodding, nodding at that. Yes, no, I think that's, that's right. And I think we've got to remember that this was the headline, or one of the headline policy announcements at the uh, Conservative Party conference back in October, which sort of took everybody a little bit by surprise, as well as ditching HS2, but um, we'll park that one there. Yeah. Um, but the, what this goes down to, I think, is it's Rishi Sunak's um, uh, days as sort of the management consultant. So, you know, just as what Aubrey was talking about there, one of the priorities of the Prime Minister is to tackle the weightiness in the NHS. And when it comes to an election, the number one issue that people talk about is the cost of living, followed by the NHS. So what are the issues in the NHS? And as Victoria was sort of saying there, the Health Secretary Victoria Atkins was saying, look, you know, a patient a minute enters A&E. There is a huge backlog in the NHS. There's, you know, it's over, uh, oversubscribed. There are too many patients that are using it for uh, uh, reasons of ill health. And so smoking, if it is a number one issue 
that it's causing the NHS to, uh, to be used time and time again, whether it's for these cardiovascular diseases, whether it's because of the uh, premature births or, or, or defects within the womb, it, all of the issues that uh, Victoria was talking about earlier on, it's getting to the heart of the problems that, uh, uh, that are in society, the ills, taking those long-term decisions for the future, as Rishi would, uh, would say, to make sure that the NHS is fit for the future, but also we as a society are healthier and happier. And so targeting smoking uh, is a way to do that. And that's why this policy, I think, has come about, even though it seemed a bit sort of you know, odd at the time that it was a headline announcement, but it's just the way in which Rishi works in terms of that management consultant style as a, as a prime minister getting to the, the heart of the issues. It's also doable, is the thing. It, you know, it, it, it will pass, it will come into law. If Rishi Sunak is thinking about his legacy, he wants to be the prime minister that did a thing. Uh, this, this could be his thing. Rwanda's not going to be his thing. Why has it already been ditched in New Zealand if it's such a practical well, and excellent idea? That, that's, that's just politics. That's just a political rebellion. Right. What's interesting here is because you have a Conservative government bringing it in, because we're almost certainly going to have a Labour government pretty soon, that means once this policy is in, this policy is, in as much as anything, is set in stone for five or six years. And I think it's going to be the sort of thing that once, it, once we've had it, no one's going to want to turn this... And are we out. talking at care. all about the, the practical nature of stopping the person who was born in a certain time in 2009 well, from buying cigarettes, but not the person who was born in, in, in 2008 and, and recognising them in the shop and producing the... You know, is it, is it going to happen? Or, is, as you say, is one of your... Simply, one of your children just going to buy buy cigarettes for the other, so everybody will smoke just as they want to if they want to. I mean, realistically, it's well. It, firstly, it's no more complicated than making sure somebody's sixteen right now and not fifteen. But also, um, it's it's a decreasing problem. You know, kids smoke much less than they used to. Um, when certainly when I when I was young, everyone I knew smoked. These days, they all vape. So that, that's a whole new problem that we've got to deal with. But actually, uh, cigarette consumption among the young is, is plunging anyway, which is what makes this doable. Mm. My, my daughter said, when you see someone smoking, it looks as if they didn't get the memo. Yeah. In other words, it doesn't look cool. It isn't aspirational. Oh, you... It just looks stupid. It looks like you didn't read what it was going to do you to you, so don't do it. You show young people photos from the 90s. I show, I show my yeah. kids photos of, of, of me and my friends at university. They wonder what the hell was wrong with us. And I, and I don't really know how to answer that question. <laughs> it was a bit like when we yeah. watched Mad, Mad Men and we exactly. couldn't believe in yeah. the 60s how they were all yeah. absolutely puffing away at all times. All right, let's move on. This is inevitable. We have to discuss her. She wants us to. We're obliging. <laughs> no one can avoid it, ignore it. She said the same thing all over the place. Britain's shortest serving Prime Minister Liz Truss has released a book detailing her jaw dropping tales from her 49 days in Downing Street. And she spoke exclusively to Talk TV all about it. She said she doesn't regret a single thing. Do you regret becoming Prime Minister? I mean, sometimes I do think, was I just facing an impossible task? And given the policies I wanted to pursue, cutting taxes, getting the economy going, doing things like fracking, you know, making Britain successful, getting out of our stagnation, was it actually possible to deliver those given the massive resistance from the economic establishment, but also the fact that not enough Conservative MPs were frankly prepared to back those types of policies. I do think that. But then I think, well, if I hadn't tried, would I regret it now? And I just think in politics, you know, the I never thought Boris Johnson should have been deposed. I thought it was a massive mistake. And I was not desperate to put myself forward I just felt, I felt compelled to because I felt there were serious issues that we needed to deal with. I think lots of people have, have gazed upon these interviews that Liz Truss has given and gazed upon the excerpts from the book that have been massively publicised and wondered more than anything about her personality type, about what kind of a person she could possibly be because who does, you know, a, I suppose receive such a kind of worldwide drubbing, be in and out of Downing Street historically quicker than anybody has ever been before and probably ever will be after, and yet kind of absolutely front it up with this astounding level of self-belief. Yeah, the whole thing's... Be I mean, to me, it's absolutely bewildering. I, you need the wisdom of Freud and Solomon combined, Hugo. She, 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 she's just... She rewrites history. That's how she processes it. That this whole thing about the, that she was facing an onslaught from the financial establishment. No, she had mad plans and the financial establishment couldn't put them into play in the way that she wanted them to. The Treasury couldn't do what she wanted because it was undoable. She also says, oh, it's a terrible shame they got rid of Boris Johnson. 
but she tore up all of his government's plans and embarked upon a different, immediately different programme afterwards. So, I mean, it, it's like she spent the last, however long it is, what, year and a half, uh, sort of recasting history in some way that doesn't make her sound bonkers. And she, and talks she hasn't of, managed And she's a tremendous abolitionist. Look at all the things she'd like to abolish. Mm. European Court of Human Rights or our membership thereof, uh, Bank of England leader. I mean, virtually everyone except for Nigel Farage and Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Well, well, yes, and I think... Um, uh, if I was to give her a little bit of a little bit of, um, of defence, you know, she, she 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 was right, I think, to say that the um, uh, some institutions, some uh, individuals were against her for the start, but the failure to recognise that, I mean, she she didn't top the ballot of MPs, so you know, Rishi Sunak won the ballot of MPs before it went to the membership, so she won you know, fair and square by the membership, but you've got to then recognise that if you've got your parliamentary party that half over half didn't support you. The idea then you sort of just ride into number oh. 10 on a camel cade and start tearing things up willy nilly and start sort of, you know, having your image. You've got to bring people with you. You've got to take it slow. But and she didn't take it slow, and that's what the problem was. But the idea that institutions were against her, it's like saying that the fire brigade is against you starting fires. I mean, it's like, yes, of course. Well, it, it, you know, the yeah. institutions that are tasked with maintaining the stability of the British economy, of course they, I mean, of course, the, by virtue of doing their job, this is literally what happened with uh, the Bank of England. And, 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 and also, it, exactly, is, is, yes, it, yes. is it not an incredibly childish way of putting it and viewing it against me. They're not yeah. against mm. you. They're there to help and guide and advise and pilot. They're not there to oppose. That's not the, if, that's not yeah. the purpose well, of them, is it? If you it? wish to give them a mandate that doesn't, that, that, that doesn't involve pre pre preventing the British economy from being flushed down the pan, yeah. then as Prime Minister, you have the power to do that. She yeah. didn't do that. She and, tried to do both at once. And, and, and again, you know, if you want to, you know, if the economy is your number one focus, cutting taxes mm -hmm. and you know, tearing up regulation and all the rest of the things that she wanted to do, things that actually, I think, you know, in isolation are not bad policies. They are conservative policies, but there has to be the right economic framework and the time to do it. You don't necessarily achieve uh, goodwill within the Treasury by sacking the Permanent Secretary on day one. She got rid of Tom Scholar, who'd been yeah. there for years and years. You have to bring people with you to say, look, this is an ambitious plan. Uh, I want everybody around the table. I want to bring you all with me. We can do this together. Not sort of firing people, as I say, left, right, Let, let me bring Aubrey into this. Aubrey, she has said categorically and repeatedly that she is not responsible for nuking the economy. She is not responsible for fiscal uh, um, madness and insanity. It is not her fault. She didn't do it. She's not to blame. And then she suggested a whole raft of other individuals and institutions that are to blame. Now, what, what do you think? What's your forensic response to her assertion? There's nothing to see here and it wasn't her fault anyway. I think most Conservative MPs these days treat her as a bit of a joke and really wish that she wouldn't make these interventions anymore because they remind voters of a really kind of painful period. And regardless of the arguments about who was responsible for the uh, impact on inflation and mortgage costs, she is so sort of closely associated with that time that it's really sort of toxic, most Conservative MPs would say, for her to be going out about in the weeks before the local elections, reminding everybody of her premiership. I think the thing that will unsettle the most is her comment saying that she has unfinished business. Liz Truss certainly, I think, understands that she probably can't be the person who leads the Conservative Party again to advocate for her ideals. But she has been working significantly hard behind the scenes to try and win the support of Tory candidates, i.e. those who are vying to become Conservative MPs in the future and will have a say in the next leader. Mm. Those are the people she's really got her eye on because I think she feels like she's given up on this current parliamentary party. All right, well, it's still a little hard to hear you. Let, let's, let's just focus on two things. I'm going to ask you both the same two questions. Number one, do we think there's going to be an appetite among purchasers and voracious readers and book clubs worldwide to devour every word that Liz Truss has written? In other words, is it going to be a bestseller? And also, what do you think the future holds for Liz Truss? Because it sounds as if she's still got, you know, turbulent and absolutely compelling political ambition, Hugo, doesn't she? Yes. I don't think there are going to be that many people who want to read her book because it is neither it is neither wise enough nor mad enough to be good reading. Right. I'm sure she tried to make it mad enough. She didn't quite even get there. She talks about the her... deep state, doesn't she, whatever uh, that is. Deep state of what? I don't know what she thinks it is. In, Amer in America, the deep state is the, is the military and the secret service, and yeah. here it seems to be the teaching unions. It's madness. Yeah. Um, what, what her future holds, she clearly sees her future in America. Oh, uh, do you think so? Oh. Maybe, maybe she'll host, host a mad podcast for mad people. I don't see her, I don't see her um, having any great political future here. What no. do you think, Charlie? 
Um, well, I think she might have a, an eye on a comeback. Probably not for the top job, but like David Cameron, he's went away for a bit and has uh, been able to come back. She, or maybe she'd like to be the uh, the shadow chancellor, sure or indeed the chancellor. I'm sure, know, she'd like to. Be. Is, uh, um, yeah. But I mean, this is someone. What's remarkable about Liz? I, I will, I will read it. Um, mm. uh, uh, I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> 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 I will, um, I will read. It. <laughs> But, you know, this was a one. She, she fascinates me to a, le to a certain degree because you know she wasn't an inexperienced politician. You know she was the education secretary. She was chief secretary of the treasury. She was the environment secretary. She was the justice secretary. Uh, you know she was um, a foreign secretary. She went on to become prime minister. You know she is not someone who has been uh, in the background of British politics, yeah. and therefore to have such a short stint as prime minister because of all the things that went wrong uh, of her own doing, I you know, accept. Um, it, it is quite a fascinating. Uh, um, uh, it, except, reading. except it won't be fascinating if it's written with no insight whatsoever, and also complete lack of humility or any kind of willingness to accept any sort of responsibility. I mean, if it's written from a kind of strange place on the spectrum, which sees everything in a skewed and peculiar manner, then it won't be very interesting. It'll be, won't it? Like, like, like reading the testimony of somebody who's not, not quite, you know, uh, you know, some, some se se several kind of sandwiches. Sort of whatever it is, a picnic, isn't it? It's so simple. She pursued a policy of radical growth while the Bank of England had a mandate to keep inflation down. You cannot do both these things at once. The only way you do both these things at once is by rocketing up interest rates. That's what happened. That's why her government fell apart. If that's not the beginning and end of chapters one through ten, she's not grasped what happened. And to link just what finally what you're yeah. saying about um, uh, America, obviously she might be channeling herself as sort of you know, the Donald Trump, you know, who sort of refused the election, you know, sort of refused yeah. to accept the election, you know, uh, has told everybody how great he still is, and he's making a comeback. He looks as though he's going to be the Republican nominee. He looks as though he might go on to be the president again of the United States. And so I think you know Liz is probably taking maybe a leaf out of his book to say if you just keep sort of you know your uh, fan base. Uh, a clue sometimes. What fan base? And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> okay, I said, I, said that, I said that was but, my know, last question, but I, 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 I'm going to change my mind. <laughs> what do you think? I mean, if, if you were to get Boris Johnson in a quiet mm. corner, I know this is surmising, you can't possibly know what he, exactly what he would say, but what do you, Hugo, think is his view of Liz Truss? What do you think he thinks of her? I shouldn't imagine he thinks much of her. I think if he was Prime Minister, he'd probably give her a job because she's safe. Uh, for him, she's safe. God knows, not for anybody else. Mm. But for him, she's safe. I should. I don't think Boris Johnson really rates anybody who isn't Boris Johnson. But I, I think he'd have thought that she's somebody he could have in a government who would do more or less what she was told to do by, by him without causing too many problems. What do you think? Yes, well, I failed to mention that I think he made her international trade secretary as well as one of her um, uh -huh. uh, list of achievements, but um, uh, or jobs. Um, but I think he, I, th I do agree with you, I think she would have been a safe place. She wouldn't have been a threat. And I think, you know, Boris was quite keen to support her in the leadership because he might have thought, look, if it goes terribly wrong in the way that it did, that he might be able to come back uh, after after her. That was a sort of... And just one more question. Thing. I can't help it. I, mean, just, uh, <laughs> I, I can't help it. She, she said repeatedly that she would like Nigel Farage, who is, what is he, the president emeritus of, 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 of the Reform Party, to be a, a Tory party uh, MP. What's she talking about there? Why did she think that? I mean, I don't know. Why does why does a dog bark? I don't know. I, I honestly, it's, it's it's the sort of thing that her that what she believes to be her base wants her to say. That's it. You agree? Well, I think um, the threat of reform to the Conservatives is obviously as such as seeing them increasing sort of uh, popularity in the polls. I think she feels this might be a way just to sort of you know cement and bring back together the right of the party uh, to make it the Conservative Party. Um, but I think that will. Uh, be something that um, uh, Nigel can only be the one to decide whether he will or will not join the Conservative Party or it's not. It's only an interesting sidebar, I think <laughs> this is, something you can't avoid. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. Thank you all. Coming up after the break, Rishi Sunak's under pressure to designate Iran's Revolutionary Guards a terrorist group after the attack on Israel. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman is a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't <laughs> too keen on that. I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> <laughs> Yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're yeah, supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has so far rejected pressure to prescribe Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard, a terrorist organisation, following the country's missile and drone barrage aimed at Israel. Iran and its proxies in Iraq, Syria and Yemen fired a wave of projectiles on Saturday, with most being downed by Israel and its allies. The Israeli government wants sanctions to be imposed on Iran's missile project following the unprecedented assault. Israel's war cabinet's been meeting for the third time in as many days, with the government reporting split between hitting Iran hard and maintaining allies' support. Calls for restraint have come from all areas of the globe, but Israel's vowed to respond to the attack. Joining me in the studio now, security expert Will Geddes. Hello, Will. And down the line, we're joined by retired General Tim Cross, who commanded one of the three divisions of the UK Field Army. General Cross, thank you so much for joining us. Why don't I start with you on this one? I mean, there's a sure. great deal, of course, of reaction around the world to this, and Israel being advised and told in pretty categorical and unequivocal terms, you know, keep your powder dry, don't overreact, and as David Cameron, our Foreign Secretary, said, uh, respond with the head and not the heart. But then there's also a welter of opinion which says, um, you know, no other country in the world would be told, so, you know, you've had 300 missiles raining down on you, well, sit back, relax, don't overreact. That's an unreal expectation, not one that kind of holds water anywhere in the world. So I'm wondering what you think with your wealth of military expertise on this one? Well, I have to say, I come down in the context of what you've just said, I come down on the side of, of caution and uh, what uh, David Cameron and lots of others are saying. I mean, we do need to see broader context of, of this, which is you know, a pretty big context. I mean, I was born in, the, in 51. I remember the 56, 67, 73, you know, et cetera, et cetera, wars that have gone on. So we've had almost 100 years of this going on in the Middle East between Israel and the Arab nations. Mm. And um, at the end of the day, the only way this is going to stop is for people to, wise judgment of people to stop reacting and simply retaliating every time something happens. Now, of course, I've got huge sympathy with Israel. I mean, I, I have to say, I sit on the, you know, their side of the fence on this. 
But I do think that simply reacting now in, in a way is not going to help. They need to pause. And I think when they said the other day, first of all, that they would they would react, you know, in, in a time and, and place of their own choosing. I thought that was a sort of step back and maybe thinking about, you know, a more a more judge, judgment, uh, a considered judgment of what to do. I hope that they don't now try and do something which hits Iran, because all that's going to end up with is further spread of the conflict and the real danger. Well, one of the things that Iran did not do was to order Hezbollah, for example, to, to use an awful lot of missiles, that there'd be tens of thousands of missiles that Hezbollah have got in Syria. So although, of course, it was a, you know, a, a, diff, a dangerous strike and, and all of that, but the bottom line is, in some ways, I think it was a it was it was more restricted than some people feared. And I think collectively we need statesmen around the world to stop talking up war and try and talk down uh, what's going on here and and bring some considered judgment to the whole piece. Which are the statesmen around the world? Which countries do you think are talking uh, up war rather than trying to allay the intention to, to, to retaliate? Who are the countries you think are responsible for, for kind of ramping it up? Well, clearly Israel and Iran are part of that. I have to say, uh, you know, forgive me in one sense, but I have to say that the media too, we have a lot of commentators all and writing, you know, I've been reading a lot about this as you have, a lot of people saying that they have got to retaliate, they've got to, you know, they can't allow Iran to get away with this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do, I don't want to sound despairing, but I, do, I don't see an awful lot of statesmen and women around the world with the sort of wisdom we need here. To be fair, Biden and indeed our own prime minister have been saying publicly uh, a number of things, but what we need is influence behind, we need diplomacy. We need to get back to quiet diplomacy with people speaking behind the media headlines and appearing every five minutes, uh, you know, on the media in the round and putting influence to bear on people like Netanyahu. Within the Arab world, actually, I think there are some serious players who are trying to do that. Uh, we're seeing it in, in Qatar. We're seeing other Arab nations involved in this. And it was interesting that in the context of what's happening, there were Arab nations uh, who were involved, if you like, in dealing with this Iranian threat, Jordan closing its airspace, for example. Uh, that's not the same when it comes to Gaza. So I think there are Arab nations that we should be working with and getting them to try and influence uh, you know, what's going on. And we need to quietly behind the scenes continue to put pressure on Netanyahu. I'm bring... not awfully confident that there's a lot of good stuff going on, is the truth, but I hope I'm wrong. Let me bring Will Geddes into the picture. Um, do you think it's realistic to expect Netanyahu to bow to pressure because that so far hasn't been his character trait, really, or his policy? Yeah, no, firstly, I have to agree with everything Tim said. Yeah. I, can't, I can't disagree with any of that. I think the, the, the first thing is Netanyahu, who's not best liked by Israelis themselves. No. The vast majority don't like him. This has given him more wind to his sails, if you like, in terms of his actions, particularly against Hamas, uh, and certainly against Iran. In terms of the pressure on him, whether he wants to or not, I think he's going to be swayed by certainly the international community and international statesmen, and especially Joe Biden. Joe Biden is an election year. If he was to support Netanyahu in a retaliation against Iran, uh, I think uh, he would put himself at great jeopardy of his potential candidacy. Uh, for uh, president for another term. Mm. I think the other issue is David Cameron's actually talking an awful lot of sense. Uh, and again, as Tim was saying, he's looking for calm. He's looking for, for, you know, cool heads to look at a very hot situation. Netanyahu, who also doesn't have the support really of much of the international community, um, there are a number of factors at play here which will be leveled down and cascaded to many of the military generals and many of the military personnel. That, to be absolutely honest, the attack last Sunday by Iran uh, was not only thwarted by, certainly, the Israelis' countermeasures, but certainly, and this obviously impacted and was probably a very good reason why Jordan uh, certainly restricted airspace and kept all their planes grounded, is that there are four GPS systems fundamentally running across the world. Uh, one controlled by Russia, one by China, India and the United States. And I believe, and certainly from some of my sources, that the GPS by the US was taken down. So the accuracy of those attacks was going, going to be thwarted. So we know that America plays a very, very strong part. Over and beyond that, there's the economic implications. Oil prices are already exponentially higher since the conflict started. 
There is also the issue of this being a seven-month conflict, which I believe is the longest Israel has actually ever been engaged in. And there are Palestinians and Gazan citizens who are remaining in the city. And I think even if Egypt opened up its borders, which I think would be highly unlikely, they wouldn't move. They would stay where they are. So there is more about retrieving the situation, bringing it back to the table to discuss than anything else. And that is the only way this is going to get resolved in my Gentlemen, opinion. thank you both very much indeed. This is what's coming up after the break. A new study identifies low breastfeeding rates and too much alcohol as causes for breast cancer. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Thank you so much. Elizabeth. <laughs>is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right hey, too. Hey, Quite hey. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, her. We're supposed to was have another moved on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. According to a new study, one in four cases of breast cancer in the UK is preventable, with key causes being low breastfeeding rates or too much alcohol. It's calling for bold policy actions to promote better lifestyles and reduce the incidence of the disease, which is the most common form of cancer in the world. Suggestions included ministers implementing policies to encourage breastfeeding, such as supportive work environments where women can breastfeed or express milk, and smoking-style labelling restrictions on bottles of wine. Joining me now to discuss this, Dr Simon Vincent from the charity Breast Cancer Now. Dr Vincent, good to have you on the programme. So. No. This hasn't necessarily been expressed before in quite this way. The idea that if you don't breastfeed, you are effectively, to some extent at any rate, and you'll explain how much, setting yourself up maybe for contracting breast cancer. Explain how that works. 
Well, the answer is we don't really know exactly how that works biologically. But I think one of the important things here is that this is just one of several risk factors which has been highlighted in this huge report, which, which is looking at the global picture of breast cancer. Um, and I think it's important to realise that there are plenty of things that women and men as well can do to reduce their risk of getting breast cancer starting right now. Bre breastfeeding, we know, is connected with the risk of breast cancer, but we also know that there are plenty of reasons why some women might not be able to breast breastfeed. They find it difficult. They choose not to. And that's fine. Charities like Breast Cancer Now, we're not into, we, we don't want to make people feel anxious or certainly not guilty about things that they might have done in the past. What we want to do is to let people know about risk factors that they can do something about now and give them the support that they need to change so that they can actually reduce the risk of getting breast cancer in the future. So what would you say to a woman who says, well, I don't really want to breastfeed, you know, my mother didn't breastfeed me, it's not something I feel particularly comfortable about, I know some women want to, I don't really want to. What would you say to that person? Well, I, I would say that that is ultimately their choice. Um, this puts out the information, the, the, the scientific evidence which we have which says what the changes in risk are if you do and don't breastfeed. But like with all of these health decisions, ultimately it's up to the individual uh, in, uh, themselves. We can talk about the risk and we can encourage people to make changes where they can or where they, uh, they have the ability to. Um, but I, I, again, the key thing is not to worry about what you might or might not have done in the past and to make those decisions in knowledge of the risk. But there will be other factors that go against that, which might be reasons why you wouldn't breastfeed. Tell me about alcohol and the part that that plays. Well, alcohol is... Uh, drinking alcohol is a risk factor for breast cancer. Um, it's uh, a, a risk factor which increases the more alcohol you drink. Um, there is unfortunately no, no safe limit, um, but the risk at small amounts of alcohol is smaller. And so what we would say is just be sensible about your drinking, watch what you drink, take note of the guidelines that come from uh, the government and the NHS about uh, the, the sort of limits that, that one might think of. Be aware that those limits sometimes change as, as evidence changes um, and be aware that there are other risk factors that you can do something about as well. And, and tell me about obesity or even just being overweight and the part that that plays. That is um, a, a, a strong risk factor. Um, it's also important to realise that there's not just being overweight, there's also physical activity as well. And although people sometimes connect the two, they are independent risk factors. Being overweight after you've gone through the menopause for women is, is, the, is the particularly challenging risk factor. But the fact is that if you increase your physical activity, then you can reduce your risk. And when we talk about physical activity, we're not talking about everybody becoming Olympic athletes. Mm. We're talking about people making small changes to their lives, which just increase the amount of physical activity they do, maybe continuing that increase, um, walking around more, um, getting off one stop early on the bus and doing that last little bit on foot, walking up the stairs rather than taking the lift at work. Um, and even though they might sound small things, if you get into the habit of doing those and keep doing those, it doesn't matter what shape or size you are to begin with, increasing that physical activity is something that everybody can do to, to, to help reduce the risk of getting breast cancer in the future. Doctor, thank you very much indeed. And this is what's coming up after the break. Boy's Own Yo, a Boy's Own star is here to talk about a brand new book written especially for adults with learning disabilities. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge 
Quite right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Well, it's been described as the first ever fiction book specifically written for adults with learning disabilities. Edward Pureheart and the Forever Children follows the story of a carousel horse. It's written by Jennifer Munro after she struggled to find suitable books for her daughter Kate, who has an extremely rare condition which causes neurodevelopmental delays. One of the biggest supporters of the book is musician and boy's own star Keith Duffy. Keith has a daughter with autism and has also long campaigned to raise awareness of learning difficulties and disabilities. And I'm delighted to say that 23 years after we were fellow housemates in Celebrity Big brother, the very first one ever. Keith is right here in the studio with me today. So lovely to see you. You too. I can't believe it's 23 years ago, Vanessa. You 23 years ago. You and were you a haven't child. changed a bit. You're and still as gorgeous as ever. Thank you. Neither of you. You were you were absolutely beguiling then and you're beguiling now. But I remember when we were in the Big Brother house 23 years ago, weren't we celebrating your daughter Mia's birthday? Her in there? very first birthday. Yeah. And she's yeah. 24 now, obviously, for those who can count. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you, so, and you've spent a lot of time and also made made really great strides in campaigning on behalf of those with different ways of looking at the world, really. Absolutely. I mean, the blessings that they are. Um, Mia's 24 now. Um, when we were in the house, we didn't know Mia had autism. No. And it was about a year later that we had to try and get a diagnosis done. In, in Ireland at the time, there was a three and a half year waiting list. Um, for a diagnosis mm. and anybody I spoke to told me that early intervention was essential for the future of the child but if you can't get a diagnosis you can't avail of any of the services that you need for your for your, your son or your daughter so yeah. it was a real difficult time and we, we fought on and I decided while I was fighting the fight I might as well do it for other little boys and girls like me so we set up a charity back home in Ireland at the time called Irish Autism Action and now I've got the Keith Duffy Foundation and we try to support families and young guys that, that are young, young girls and guys that have autism um, but she's doing wonderful now. I know that. She's, she's doing going great now. guns, isn't she? Yeah, she's great. She went through college. Yeah. She got her degree. She yeah. graduated two years ago. Super. She's working for an American pharmaceutical company, coding and software developing. Unbelievable. And, uh, she's doing she's doing really, really well. We're, you know, she 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 sets the bar very high for herself. She definitely does. And she does. achieves. And she's and she's beautiful. And look, you know, we're we're blessed and, and we're lucky people to be have sent to, to have been sent these beautiful children to be part of our lives. Here, here. I mean, she's absolute credit to you and she's gorgeous. Tell me, though, about this book, because it's a very special kind of book. In fact, I don't think anybody watching or listening to this has ever heard of such a book before. Well, this is it. You know, young young adults, um, we, we uh, you know, 
the young adults with special needs, you know, they're, they're neither chil children nor adults, and, and re reading children's books is not appropriate. And this, this, this wonderful lady, Jenny, who I was working with all day today, has written this book, um, and it's about Edward, who is a carousel horse, mm -hmm. 100 years old, and it was his journey from when he used to be in the Texas Lone Star um, uh, Fun Fair yeah. as, as, a, as a carousel horse, and he was gifted to her daughter, Kate, who, um, who, who like you said, um, has a very, very rare diagnosis and um, autism being one of them. And uh, she's his forever friend. And what it is is Edward the horse wanted to find a forever friend. A lot of children that loved him and spoke to him and, uh, and cared for him, they grow up and they stop loving and caring for him. But the forever friends stay young forever. And they're friends forever. Sounds, it he, sounds adorable. I mean, it sounds like a charming book, really. Enchanting. Absolutely, it's beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and Kate, Jenny's daughter, is 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 the forever friend of Ed, of, of Edward and their relationship and everything else. And the the book just tells different tales. And there's there's so, there's subtle messages within the book about children with special needs, about young adults with special needs, and it kind of includes them into our world. And it makes parents that might not necessarily be lucky enough to have a child with autism understand how amazing it is to have a child with autism. Do you think in the years, I mean, the 23 years that you've been kind of encompassing this this, this situation and dealing with it, and, and as you say, helping and changing the lives of lots and lots of families, not just the children in the families, but the, the parents and the siblings, do you think people have grown in understanding and appreciation? They have definitely grown in understanding, yes, because nowadays we have the 2nd of April, which is World Autism Day. Yeah. We've got the week that's World Autism Awareness Week, um, Acceptance Week. Um, so people are, are certainly starting to listen. So people that haven't directly been in contact with children with autism or understood their quirky ways and their brilliance, um, they're getting to understand that there's something here that needs to be understood. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to ask the question and starting to research and find out for themselves. And that's brilliant because that it just includes them. Inclusion with children with autism is the most important thing, whether it be in school or kindergarten or wherever it might be. Including them in all, don't be excluding them because they've been excluded for years. We need to include them in everything. Inclusion is the word of the day and, and celebration of, the, of this book and, the, and these wonderful people. And are you still causing mayhem on the road with Brian McFadden? That's what I really want to know. Yes, in a word. <laughs> causing <laughs> havoc wherever you go. We're you having do. a great time. We're are back you still in, doing it? Yeah, yeah. We're back out on tour in the UK, January, February 25. And is it true um, that people who go to see you live are never quite the same again? Listen, I'm telling I mean, you, that we night, have, it's a night that no one can ever speak about, but they're never quite the same again. We have an old range of audience. We, we did a meet and greet in our last tour, and yeah. there was a lady that bought herself a ticket for her 90th birthday. She was there in the meet and greet on the Zimmer frame, <laughs> and she told us how much she loved us. And then the next girl in line was a six-year-old girl. Yeah. Right, and she was a daughter, our granddaughter of our oh. granny, who used to be a Boys Own fan or a Westlife fan. So we've got a whole many different generations of fans. But on the sh on the show that night, I could see the two of them sitting in the front row, and they weren't together; they were separate. But both of them knew all the lyrics of all the songs, and they were just having a great time. And look, that's all it is. It's a celebration of of Boys Own and Westlife music. Fans and, uh, spreading a little happiness. That's everywhere all we're trying to do, it. Vanessa. Oh. We're trying Keep to everybody do. happy. 23 you know? long years we've been doing nothing but that, Keith. It's always a pleasure. Thank you Lovely so much. To see you, darling. No Thank one you. will ever know what we went through. Coming up after the break, MPs will be voting on Rishi Sunak's flagship smoking bill in just a few hours' time. Does he have a Tory rebellion on his hands? I'm Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. 
May. Might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media, having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. A very warm welcome back to the show. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and this is what's coming up this hour. Up in smoke, Rishi Sunak faces yet another Tory rebellion over his bold plan to ban smoking, with a handful of cabinet ministers considering voting it down tonight. Plus, a Muslim pupil loses a high court challenge against a ban on prayer rituals at Britain's strictest school, something the head teacher says is a victory for all. And a sweet touch. Meghan Markle launches the first product from her brand new lifestyle brand, and it's a traditional English favourite. First of all, though, let us have the news headlines with Natalia Hawke. Good evening. Israel's war cabinet is expected to meet again later to discuss its retaliation to Iran's drone and missile attacks. Rishi Sunak is still hoping to speak to Benjamin Netanyahu this afternoon to urge restraint, though there are reports that the Israeli Prime Minister is refusing to take calls from world leaders. Former Defence Committee Chair Tobias Elwood told Talk TV it is right that the UK get involved before tension escalates further. What happens around the world affects us. We've embraced globalization. And if there is conflict, as we saw in Ukraine, it has a knock-on effect on our economy. And if good nations like Britain don't step forward to keep the peace, to keep stability, then there's knock-on consequences. Those vacuums are then filled by bad intentions. And we saw that in the Red Sea with what the Houthis were doing yeah. as well. Donald Trump has told reporters he should be out campaigning. Instead, the former US president has arrived at court for day two of his criminal trial, where jury selection remains underway. Trump has been accused of falsifying business records to hide payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels, allegations he again denied today. Every legal pundit, every legal scholar said this trial is a disgrace. We have a Trump-hating judge. We have a judge who shouldn't be on this case. He's totally conflicted. But this is a trial that should never happen. It should have been thrown out a long time ago. Downing Street says it is extremely disturbing that a Conservative conference in Brussels was shut down, though there aren't plans to raise it with the Belgian government. The city's mayor ordered police to prevent people from entering the event, which featured Nigel Farage and the former Home Secretary, Soila Braverman, because of fears over public safety. As he left the National Conservatism Conference, the former UKIP leader had this to say. You know, I've, I've experienced council culture personally here. I've had, you know, restaurants wouldn't serve me in Brussels in my last days as an MEP, coffee bars, even the pub I used to use said I couldn't go there anymore. Um, but what's happened here 
is now on the stage of where there is global media we can see that, 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 that legally held opinions from people who are going to win national elections is no longer acceptable here in Brussels, the home of globalism. MPs are currently debating legislation designed to give the UK some of the strictest smoking laws in the world. Rishi Sunak wants to make Generation Alpha, born since 2009, the UK's first smoke-free generation, with anyone turning 15 this year banned from buying cigarettes. But many Conservative MPs are expected to rebel against the plans. Radiographers say bras should be stripped of VAT. The health professionals say, like menstrual products, they're a basic necessity and that the tax disproportionately affects women. They are set to propose a motion to remove tax on bras at their annual conference in Leeds later. And the countdown to the Olympic Games is well and truly on, with the Olympic flame lit today at a ceremony in Greece's ancient Olympia, the home of the first Games in 776 BC. The torch will now travel 3,000 miles through Greece before heading to France. It will eventually arrive in Paris in July for the start of this year's competition. That's all from me. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it's been pretty blustery out there today with some bright or sunny spells, but also some showers and some of them have been rather heavy and thundery, although it hasn't been as windy as it was yesterday. Still going to be quite blustery over the next 24 hours and still fairly unsettled uh, and also feeling cool as the winds continue to come from a northerly direction. With the brisk winds overnight, that does mean it will be a mostly frost-free night. Not completely. I think there will still be a patch of frost in some rural areas, particularly for Scotland. And showers will continue around the northeast of Scotland, some of these wintry over the high ground, as well as some eastern coasts of England and out towards parts of the west. But min many inland areas will be mainly dry and clear, but a chilly night to come. And then through tomorrow, lots of sunshine to begin the day, but showers will develop across parts of uh, inland areas and around coastal parts of the east. There will also be outbreaks of rain and cloudy skies developing across Ireland, Northern Ireland and later towards Western Scotland. Again, temperatures fairly normal for the time of year, up to around 11 or 12 degrees Celsius. It continues quite unsettled for the next day or so after that, but behind me you can see an area of high pressure developing out towards the west. It will start to take over into the weekend and dominate the scene. So for the weekend, the weather will settle down. It will become a tiny bit warmer too. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Natalia and to Nazanin. Let's move directly now to our top story. Rishi Sunak's facing a potential Tory rebellion over his controversial plan to ban smoking, with dozens of his own MPs expected to vote against it. The Prime Minister's landmark tobacco and vapes bill, which aims to make it an offence to sell tobacco products to anyone born after 2009, will be put to the Commons this evening. Conservatives have been granted a rare free vote on the legislation, which means they're allowed to oppose it without being punished in any way even if they want to be. It's understood that a handful of cabinet ministers, including Kemi Bednock, will not support it, but is still likely to pass because it has backing from Labour. The Health Secretary, Victoria Atkins, kicked off the debate in the Commons earlier. For a moment, if I may, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like us to imagine that we're not in this historic and magnificent chamber, but we are instead standing at the entrance of a local hospital. A patient comes through the doors, struggling to breathe, Smoking sent their asthma spiralling out of control. A minute later, another patient passes by. Smoking caused the heart disease they're battling. A minute later, another person comes in, and then another. This vicious cycle repeats itself nearly every minute of every day in our national health system. Because here in the United Kingdom, almost one hospital admission a minute is the human cost of smoking. Joining me in the studio now, Tim Montgomery, the founder of Conservative Home, and political commentator Michael Crick. Good to have you both here. Let's start with Tim. So, 
smoking. We all know that it's bad for you. We've all seen those revolting pictures on the front of a cigarette packet. We all know that it does horrible things to your lungs and your heart and your teeth and your unborn baby, should it be in the womb and all sorts of other stuff. We all know that. So explain to me why it is that it is considered integral to the very heart and spirit of conservatism itself to robustly defend our right to do this thing that will do us such terrible damage. Well, alcohol is another thing that causes enormous damage to people. Mm -hmm. And we take this view, or traditionally have as a society, that adults, when they know the risks, can choose to consume alcohol, can smoke or not. All of these products are taxed to a huge extent. So yes, they're a huge burden on our National Health Service, but they kind of fund the care. I don't smoke, I do drink. Um, what I don't want to be, Vanessa... I thought you were is... going to give me a list of all your other habits. <laughs> yeah, well, I was quite, I was quite looking I was forward to it. I don't smoke, <laughs> I do drink, I'll... I also... I'm, I'm ready for the whole list. You don't have to stop there. Don't curtail it. No, I'm it. definitely going to stop there. Don't curtail it on my account, I'm going to definitely stop there in case my mum is watching. <laughs> <laughs> but look, um, I am not going to be someone... I hate smoking. Yes. I don't like being around the smell of a... Of you know of clothes which reek of smoking, mm -hmm. and I've seen people with respiratory problems from smoking. But I've also seen coming out of my home on a, uh, a Saturday morning or a Sunday morning in Salisbury. You know the the pavements always have that spatter of someone who's had too much to drink. You know the night before without getting too vivid. Yeah, I object to all sorts of consequences of these things, but I partake in some of them, and I don't. And I think most of us do. It's for us not. It's not for us to lecture other people on how they live their lives. It's for us to provide them with information, to tax the behaviour so that the consequences are sort of internalised and not borne by the rest of society. But I don't think we should be banning things unless there is an overriding case so to do. And yet, Michael, so many sentient adults who in freedom and at liberty make the decision to start smoking, often when they're not adults, of course, um, regret it and wish they were not in the grips of this addictive substance and feel so sorry and full of, uh, full of contrition that they've done this to themselves and wish they hadn't. And I wonder whether the idea is to rescue them from the possibility of a life of regret, plus a hacking cough and ending up costing the NHS a fortune. That is the idea, but I mean, the, the level of... I mean, when I was a boy, mm. both my parents smoked, virtually every adult smoked. I know, I remember it. Uh, and the figures have gone down and down and down, and we've largely won the war against smoking. And I think Tim's absolutely right. It's al alcohol, I think, is, is should be the target now. We should have a... Have a, have a uh, not, not banning alcohol, but nudging people in the right direction. Alcohol causes huge health problems, mm. uh, uh, cancer and, problem. and, and heart disease, uh, violence, uh, car crashes, uh, domestic violence. Yeah. I mean, terrible things caused by alcohol. Mm. And yet alcohol is regarded, I'm afraid to say, by members of our profession. Mm. Uh, I've probably been guilty of it myself, actually. Uh, you have a laugh. And, you know, you go on the radio and you say, oh, I'm suffering a hangover and so on. Whereas if somebody extolled the virtues of smoking on television and radio, they'd never, be, they'd never appear there again. So I've got the, we got the balance wrong. On this particular measure, are we really going to say to people in 30 years' time, well, Mr Crick, are you able to prove that you're 43 um, yeah. and therefore old enough to...? That I might, mean, it's, it's impractical. That, that might be a stretch be a black for market. you, Michael. <laughs> that might be a stretch for you. It might, it might. <laughs> But you see my point. It's, it's me, unworkable. But, but tell me, though, about the importance, if you think it is important, yeah. of libertarianism and also why it is pivotal and central to conservative philosophy and thinking rather than Labour thinking or Liberal Democrat thinking or SDP thinking. Why do the Conservatives own libertarianism? Why is it said to be so, well, I, I don't so, think so, so vital it, to them? But there is a concept, I've already referred to it briefly, Vanessa, but there's a concept that I think has been lost from our politics, and that is of the adult. Uh -huh. The idea that you have at the heart of any functioning society a rep responsible citizen. And the, the less you have, uh, the fewer you have responsible adults in a society, you need more of a bigger state. You need more of a state that controls, that regulates, that picks up the pieces. And strong families, strong citizens, they're the basis of a society where the government isn't too big. And so I think if you are a conservative who doesn't believe in an almighty state, you can't have that if you don't encourage responsibility. And once you start taking responsibility away from people and smoking, you're beginning, I think, a process of infantilization. 
you're beginning to communicate the idea that we don't trust you to make decisions. And if people, you know, it's like muscle memory, it's like everything. If you no longer have certain functions regularly exercised, you cease to, they cease to be the powerful fit. And how are the Labour Party supposed be? to feel about that? They're meant to feel differently about that or the same? Well, I mean, I have liberty has been a traditional well, cause of the left. And of course, you still see it, for example, in, amongst those people on the left who believe in uh, liberalising uh, our rules on, on drugs, other than mm. drugs, because, of course, nicotine is a drug. Yeah. And indeed, you've got the contradiction in the Liberal Democrats today that they want to liberalise laws on other drugs and, 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 and pass this measure in the Commons. The thing about I, the Liberal Democrats is they're not very liberal <laughs> or very democratic, in my experience. I, and, and again, I, I agree a, a lot with Tim. And we've, you know, the people who regulate us in this country have got enough to do already yeah. without yet another requirement, which means they're spread more thinly, yeah. and so therefore they're much less, less effective. Uh, you know, you don't keep... The, the answer to society's ills is not to keep adding new laws and new rules. It's to think things through properly, to make the laws simpler, and to do it by nudging people. Do you primarily feel, through the tax Michael, system. in yeah. your lifetime, yeah. more severely restricted and regulated than you did, let's say, 30 years ago? Do you think your life is more regulated and restricted by governments and by laws than your parents was? Slightly. Slightly, I think. Um, but, I mean, not, not in an oppressive manner, um, but there are clearly a lot more laws around. And one of the reasons why police don't deal with burglaries in the way they did mm -hmm. uh, is because they do have to uh, police a lot more laws. And you only have to go and, and look at the shelf of parliamentary statutes that you might see in a big reference library and just see how every year the number of laws gets more and more and more mm -hmm. and, and the, the, the volumes get thicker and thicker. And there comes a point of, of strain. You need to simplify, codify, simplify uh, the laws of this country, the regulations, and regulate those things that really matter rather than things that are trivial and, and, and respect people's right to behave responsibly and encourage them to respect, can, behave responsibly. Can, can I answer yes, your question? Like, yes, yeah. I'm going to ask you yeah. to, yeah. to yeah. answer it, absolutely. Yeah. Do, yeah. You, do you feel more restricted and restrained what? than you used to? Do you think you're more restrained than your parents were? And do you think it's the hallmark of a civilised society that the statute book gets bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger? Because obviously it was no longer woad and a steak and you yeah. get to stick it in well, to your neighbour well, well, if you'd rather eat him for dinner. It's not that anymore, I don't feel it? more regulated as an individual, but... I think the professionals definitely are. So, for example, in the past, you like had a matron in a hospital, mm. you had a police inspector, you had a bank, a, a bank manager, and they were basically allowed to conduct their... They were trusted to do what they did until mm. they got it wrong. And then they would be subject to professional bodies that would come down uh, very high on. Now, they are so... Ill, all of them entwined with regulation, partly because we live in such a cautious society, they can't exercise their professional judgment an awful lot. That, I think, is where the nanny state really has become a problem. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that trust in people, same sort of adult theme that I was talking about earlier, that trust in people to be the cl clinician, the police officer, the lender, that, and, and function properly until they get it wrong. There's a presumption now that they're going to get it wrong and they have to operate in a thicket of legislation. That, I think, is the fundamental thing that's changed in that society. I mean, the, only, the only trouble with that is that, uh, you know, people, bank managers and, and policemen didn't always behave well in no. the past. They were, I mean, the policemen, metropolitan police, for instance, was deeply corrupt. Mm -hmm. And there were some pretty awful things that went on I mean, in the past. I, when I was a 10-year-old train spotter, I used to travel around the country and I would just wander around <laughs> railway sheds with huge locomotives and in some cases, electric life rails. <laughs> yeah. And nobody would stop me. We're lucky now, to I still mean, have you with us. <laughs> and is that, I, I is that, was that good? Somehow. Was that good or was that bad? Is that nostalgia? Well, it was good for me that... at the time. But if you think about it rationally, allowing uh, children to wander around a railway shed unsupervised. But all of these bonkers. things are questions of balance. But people will say yeah. it was terrific because it got you very early on to kind of look out for your own safety, to that, have, that a, is true. have and, a sense and, and of, of kind of proportion from my parents, and propriety. Yeah. But you see, lots of people who, 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 who wish they had a bit more liberty very much are nostalgic about the fact that they used to be able to beat their own children black and blue if they yeah. wanted to. Mm. You know, speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes and think it's an appalling curtailing of their liberty. 
that now you're not allowed to hit a child hard enough to lead him a mark. And if you do, you might be in trouble. So there are lots of things that people are nostalgic for, lots of freedoms, mm -hmm. and the freedom of a man to give his wife a good biff round the head if she got in his nerves, that kind of thing, that lots of people, you know, still lament the, the, the loss of. And I don't think necessarily we agree with them, do we? Uh, uh, well, we don't agree with them. No. But on the other hand, sometimes it's taken too far when you, uh, for instance, people get into trouble uh, for saying the wrong thing. Oh. Uh, and sometimes uh, thinking the wrong uh, thing. Or, yes, uh, and, and uh, so, and yeah, the other, and says it's a matter of balance. And the other extreme, yeah. you have laws in Scotland now that if a parent objects to their children becoming trans, they're the people that potentially end up in front of a judge, mm -hmm. not the people trying to you know, encourage them when they're still immature to take a, such a profound decision. So All right, let's move from that straight to Liz Truss. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Moving on now, Britain's shortest serving Prime Minister Liz Truss has released a book detailing her jaw dropping tales from her 49 days in Downing Street. And she spoke exclusively to Talk TV all about it. She said she doesn't regret a single thing. Do you regret becoming Prime Minister? I mean, sometimes I do think, was I just facing an impossible task? And given the policies I wanted to pursue, cutting taxes, getting the economy going, doing things like fracking, you know, making Britain successful, getting out of our stagnation, was it actually possible to deliver those given the massive resistance from the economic establishment, but also the fact that not enough Conservative MPs were frankly prepared to back those types of policies? I do think that. But then I think, well, if I hadn't tried, would I regret it now? And I just think in politics, you know, the I never thought Boris Johnson should have been deposed. I thought it was a massive mistake. And I was not desperate to put myself forward. I just felt, I felt compelled to because I felt there were serious issues that we needed to deal with. Michael, are you aching, itching, or any other verb to read the book? Not at all. I mean, I'm, I buy all these books just for the library, but I think it's most unlikely I will actually read it. I might use it for reference purposes. And you say she talked exclusively to t talk TV. She's talked Hang a on, moment. She's talked. To <laughs> that was exclusive to us. <laughs> <laughs> Never another exclusive interview. Quite right. And 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 you know, I, there's almost an element here of 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 the media, you know, having a good laugh at her. And I, Liz Truss should go and run a hotel in New Zealand or something. Get us far away from. I the wouldn't stay there. I wouldn't <laughs> stay there if she did. But isn't leave. one of the interesting things yeah, about this? Yeah. You know, the phenomenon of her personality. I know the personality type, which I think is almost unidentifiable. <laughs> because, as you say, you think she should go and run a hotel yeah. in New Zealand. What you mean is she should hang her head in shame yeah. at her absolute mishandling and kind of uh, the ab utter abomination she made of being Prime Minister, the fact that she's the shortest serving Prime Minister in British history. I mean, it's a pretty... Vanessa, good... this, she didn't make any mistakes. Well, exactly. I don't know what you're referring to. The kind of a personality <laughs> know, type exactly. <laughs> allows somebody, A, to write a book and B, to give innumerable interviews, stating that what she was really trying to do was actually impossible. It was not her fault, but yeah. the fault of the office itself that meant that she was rendered incapable of doing it because it was the fault of the job, not her fault. How is that even... I don't even recognise that as a as a known personality type, do you? No, What's I mean, going on there? She's do, she has done the country and her party huge harm. And, of course, I, don't, did, I can't remember who you supported, but... Uh, yes, that, you know, everyone but, yeah. that, Right. I mean, everybody, not everybody, lots of Conservatives knew what kind of person she, she is yes. and that she was utterly unsuitable for the job. And we've had two people in the last five years who mm. were utterly unsuitable for the job. Uh, some people would argue three. Mm. But, um, I, and by which I mean Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. Yeah, we know who you uh, mean. No, and, you know, please, we don't need to hear more from her. I, you know, I disagree with nearly everything she says. But I particularly disagree with what she says about Trump yes. and the dangers that that would involve, in my view. Um, and, uh, oh, and her support for Boris Johnson. I, I disagree with that. And, uh, you know, this... Prime, the trouble is, prime ministers always think they can come back. Uh, you know, Thatcher, Macmillan, Heath, Blair, uh, Cameron, probably. Uh, most of them think they can, apart from Theresa May, they think, and Boris Johnson, of course, and none of them come back. And uh, there was a time when prime ministers always used to come back. Not anymore. Leave the stage, shut up, 
Uh, go and run your hotel in New Zealand and come back she's in 10 years' time opposite. and take your place in Michael, the House of Lords. she's not listening to you, Tim. She's got no. no intention of doing that at all. None <laughs> of the things he suggests she should do is she contemplating doing. In fact, she's incredibly voluble and nobody can deny mm. diligent in selling that wretched book. She's absolutely <laughs> determined, isn't she, to leave no furrow unplowed. She is flogging that thing. And it's selling well, apparently. incredible <laughs> diligence. Uh, the implication is that there's something in it that we don't already know. There might be something fascinating. One of the things she talks about, of course, is the deep state. And I hope that people watching and listening to this right now are as confused and confounded as I am by that phrase. What the hell is she talking about? Mm. What is it? Well, I think we are the problem, us three here, well, yeah. criticising her because she didn't make any mistakes when she was Prime Minister. It was the negativity of people like us that brought her down. Oh, we're not the blob, are we? I think we I probably hope... are. All part of the deep state. I don't know. We're probably states, funded we? by the deep state in some way. I don't want to be either of those we, Some of us, I think, read the Financial <laughs> Times occasionally. That makes us part of the problem. But... Unlike, say, Michael, the sort of list that she gave in that clip of the things that she believed in, they're actually, they're things that I believe in. I don't want... I like to see fracking, I'd like to see tax cuts, etc. But what really annoys me about her is just the, the shallowness of it. I happen to believe in those things. But just... It's not enough to become Prime Minister just because you want those things to happen to assume that they should happen and they will happen. And if they don't happen, it's everyone else's fault. I'm old enough to remember Margaret Thatcher. So many things like... The defeat of the miners, the, the grit that the miners had on the UK. Mrs Thatcher knew you couldn't have that battle at the beginning. Britain wasn't ready, didn't have the coal stocks for a long strike. She waited until her second term before mm. she took on the miners. She knew how difficult government was in multiple ways. She waited she, a lot of, for a lot of things to her second yes, term. Yes, and didn't do certain things taxes, altogether. Privatised, yeah. a lot of the... Not much privatisation to start yeah. with either. Yeah. And she surrounded herself, certainly in the beginning, she went a little bit more sort of um, hoity-toity towards the end, but at the beginning she had lots of people in her cabinet who disagreed with her. And she knew that... She, did, she, she relished internal debate because she knew if she lost internal debate... It was better to lose internally than externally. What? Whereas Liz Truss surrounded herself with yes people, mm. and so none of that internal scrutiny you'd expect any grown-up mm. government to have. So, well, as it's... someone who's basically her ideological soulmate, uh... I'm in a way more angry with her, perhaps even than you two, because yeah. she's bringing my <laughs> ideas into uh, the ideas I care about into disrepute. I mean, Charlie Ray was here for the first hour of the show, yeah. and he listed all of the high offices that she's occupied, and then almost everything including justice secretary and virtually every other thing you could possibly... You know, every, every juicy plum there was yeah. was rolled in her direction. So here's my question. She was seasoned and experienced, extremely experienced. Well, she didn't do so, many of those jobs for very no, long, inevitably, so, so, because... So, <laughs> how could she go bowling in in this kind of gung-ho, incredibly clumsy and, in fact, destructive, ultimately, very fast way what what didn't she get what do you think was the reason and the and the and the cause of her rapid downfall let's start with michael and well i mean him. as tim says she tried to do it all too far too fast but why why didn't she well, because know she, about that because people feel they need to make an impact straight away before they're grabbed by the blob or the civil service or the deep state or whatever mm. and if you take these actions with these radical budgets straight away before anybody's got a chance to oppose you that's the way of getting it through mm. i would have thought was her thinking yeah. but i mean your point Tim about uh, internal dissent and internal argument mm. is really really important and she's not the only Prime Minister to have got rid of dissent within a, in recent years and Starmer is going to do exactly the same thing and, and it's really, if you are a confident uh, effective Prime Minister you're not worried about internal criticism and challenge because either you know you either take on board the points that people are making or you rebut them uh, and, but you, you test your ideas in debate uh, around the cabinet table, in the House of Commons, within your party. And, and, and the best, and, and that, yeah. the most successful period of actually Conservative government the last 14 years was, funny enough, the coalition government. When you had at the heart of you, you had Nick Clegg and I think it was Danny Alexander, Liberal Democrats. Nothing emerged without those two agreeing stuff with David Cameron and George Osborne. Mm. So everything was absolutely, you know, tested internally before it had to meet public. And that's the thing that is most absent. That would be my answer to your question. OK, and will the book be a bestseller? I think people may just be a sort of complete curiosity. Who is this woman? Why is she writing a book? Why hasn't she gone off to a hotel in New Zealand? I think <laughs> I, you know, and the little observations like when the Queen died yeah. and she said, why me? Why now? You know, the... <laughs> I, I, know, I, I must say, I did, I did notice that. That was a most remarkable... <laughs> 
to react that way, yeah. but B, to put it in the book. Yeah. <laughs> that way, that way. Oh, blimey, that was amazing. I'm glad you mentioned that. Yeah, so Absolutely. people are wondering whether there are other things like that and they'll buy the book for that reason. Apparently it's been selling well these last few yes. days. I mean, a lot of political books don't sell well at all. You know, I've written a few of them myself. <laughs> but um, this one may well sell well. Uh, perversely, well, I suppose it's the blanket coverage. It's bound to pick well, up a few. It's the Lady few, Jane Grey thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. now, you want to know what the hell was going on, the hokey cokey. Thank you, gentlemen, very much indeed. Coming up after the break. Today, a Muslim pupil has lost a legal challenge over their school's controversial prayer ban. I'm Vanessa Feltz, Law with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thank you. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're it to was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. A Muslim pupil from a high-achieving North London school has lost a legal challenge over its ban on prayer rituals. The student, who can't be named, took legal action against the Michaela Community School in Brent, claiming the policy made minorities feel alienated in society. But the judge today dismissed the case, saying there's a rational connection between the aim of promoting the team ethos of the school and the prayer ritual policy. Joining me now to discuss this, Talk TV's international yeah. editor Isabel Oakshot and head of policy at the Centre for Education and Youth, Baz Ramallah. Thank you both for joining me. Let's start with you, Isabel. Uh, this is Catherine Barbell Singh's school. We all know that she is a, a headmistress who is very unusual in this country and has a great deal of uh, coverage at all times. Uh, many people are great fans of her work. Other people feel that she's draconian in her imposition of discipline. Can you explain why you think the school has an anti-prayer ritual policy, Isabel? 
Well, Catherine Burble Singh has been tremendously articulate in her own explanation for the reasons for not allowing uh, Muslim students to have a particular space set aside for them to follow their ritual prayer sessions. Um, on the one hand, on a very simple level, there is a practical obstacle to this. The Michaela School, I've been fortunate enough to visit. It is on a very restricted site. It's a, an inner city school, very limited building, really. They don't have tremendous sports facilities or indeed really any extra space for anything discretionary. But that's really very marginal relative to the bigger reason and justification for the school's policy on this. And that is all about inclusivity, which is sort of paradoxical because the student who brought the case uh, against the school, uh, by the way, using some £150,000 worth of taxpayer money, did so on the grounds of inclusivity. She argued that not allowing uh, Muslim students to disappear periodically during the day to pray uh, made them somehow feel excluded. Catherine Burble Singh's point, and one that the judge wholeheartedly accepted, is that in order to hold that unique school together, because it is an absolute melting pot, there are children of all faiths and none who attend that school, she does not want students segregating on religious lines. She doesn't want groups of students who are of one faith or another having separate and different rules. And everybody who signs up to go to the school knows that's the deal. They know that before they join. It's made very, very plain. So quite why this student saw fit to continue being at the school, knowing that this was the school's clear policy, uh, frankly, I find very strange. And I do think it has been a tremendous abuse of taxpayers' money. Let me bring Baz into the discussion. Baz, um, how, how usual or unusual is it, would you say, for Muslim pupils to want to observe a prayer ritual and to leave the classroom to pray or to pray in a different room during break or whatever is necessary? I think this is the really key thing when it comes to this story is that, you know, absolutely we should respect the ruling of the court here. But what we definitely shouldn't do is generalise from Michaela to other schools and start thinking that we can't have both social cohesion and great exam results in the school, as well as pupils being able to practice their same their faith in that same school. Because the fundamental fact is that thousands of schools across the country manage to have all three of those things. And if Michaela is interested, then there is a lot that they could learn from those schools in terms of being able to create space while maintaining their ethos for peoples to be able to practice their faith. So it's absolutely very common, Vanessa, and lots of schools get this right. And, and, and how in practice does it work? Because I mean, I, I'm from a Jewish family, Jewish background, and at my school on certain days of the week, we had Jewish prayers. So there would be a mainstream prayers, which I suppose were, were, were ideologically Christian prayers, and the Jewish girls would all troop off to a different room upstairs and, I don't know, sing a few songs and kind of have a good gossip and be quite pleased to miss out on the other prayers. And prayers were at the same time and they were all over. Everybody got on with work, their schoolwork for the rest of the day. But Muslim prayer ritual is a bit more repetitive, a bit more demanding and occurs more often than just one prayer at the beginning of the day. So how does it work in terms of not separating pupils off from other pupils? Well, let's be really clear. Like, I'm not familiar with any cases of Muslim pupils leaving lessons in order to go and pray, particularly on mass whatsoever. What typically tends to happen in schools that are in areas which have a high Muslim population or indeed schools that have Muslims is that they have a multi-faith prayer room, possibly more than one, which is used by pupils of all faiths to pray as in relation to their faith. And this is done at uh, prescribed times, for example, break time, lunchtime, before school, after school. This isn't something about pupils leaving schools. And also, this is also a ritualized process, which for Muslims does not take a long time. It only takes a few minutes. Uh, young people are able to do their prayer rituals and then proceed with the rest of wider school life. So lots of schools are able to do this, are able to do it in a way where it aligns with the social cohesion 
uh, myself and Isabel want in schools, as well as making sure young people are able to get great exam results. So let me finish with Isabel. Isabel, do you assume and hope that this message now will percolate and permeate among other schools? Or do you think Catherine Burbel Singh and her school, the Michaela, is a unique and most uh, particular establishment? And as Baz says, you know, Muslim ritual prayers will be said by children all over this country in different schools. This ruling won't main, mean much apart from at that school. Well, I do think it is it is a landmark ruling, an incredibly important one. And I was very concerned that if it had not gone uh, the right way, then we would have lost Michaela's school effectively. I think Catherine Burble Singh might have felt she didn't want to continue uh, and who could blame her. Um, I did slightly bristle at the suggestion uh, that Michaela should learn from other schools. I would turn that right the way around and say that this is an outstanding school. It gets on average much better GCSE results than any other schools. It also consistently gets the highest level of uh, change in progress, you know, attainment uh, differential. So I don't think Michaela needs to take any lessons from anyone else, quite the reverse. I think other schools should learn from Michaela. It is an, an extraordinary uh, institution. And I think Catherine Burble Singh uh, has given tremendous selfless leadership under unbelievable pressure. Thank you both very much indeed. This is what's coming up after the break. Pret customers have been left furious after the high street coffee chain made changes to their subscription service. I'm Vanessa Feltz. You're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Ooh, we're missing. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, <laughs> a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did fail to, her. Yeah, it was supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV.
Welcome back. Pret a Manger has come under fire for recent changes made to its subscription service, which make it harder to access the benefits. The high street coffee chain says customers now have to log into the app each time they want to scan their unique QR code, which gets them one of their five free drinks a day. They've introduced the move to stop subscribers sharing their memberships with family and friends, which was causing more of a financial burden on the company than it had anticipated. Joining us to discuss what's gone wrong here is consumer journalist and columnist at the Times, Harry Wallop. How good to have you on the show, Harry. Lovely to see you. Some people have compared the Pret coffee debacle with the Hoover Florida tickets debacle, which I remember very clearly. And I was hoping you might um, explain to people what the Hoover fiasco turned out to be. Well, the Hoover fiasco was when the vacuum cleaner company offered flights to America. This is quite some time ago when flying to America was a deeply glamorous thing to do. Mm. And all you had to do was spend um, £100, I think, on a vacuum cleaner. Uh, and you could get essentially, I think it, in those days, it was about £600 worth it cost to fly uh, to America. Uh, and they got inundated. They completely miscalculated how many people want to take advantage of this deal. And the company, I mean, it's no exaggeration to say, nearly collapsed mm -hmm. as a result of this. Uh, it was a huge uh, fiasco because the word spread that this was an incredible deal and people piled in. I don't think Pret is in quite as much trouble as Hoover was uh, back then, but they've got themselves into a, a bit of a pickle. And explain why they didn't realise how many people would take advantage of the five free drinks a day thing. Is it that you have to make a down payment of £30 and for that £30 you get five drinks a day every day for the rest of your life? Or what was the offer, for goodness sake? So when they launched it in the depths of COVID when PrEP was in real uh, struggle. Uh, and, and if you remember, people sort of eat out to save PrEP became the... Uh, the, the quip, because we thought the company was going to go bust and it was a sign, you know, office office life was dead and Pret was, was you know, not going to exist. So they launched this scheme. Back then it was £20 and you could get more or less unlimited barista made drinks. It was five drinks a day. You couldn't all get them in one go. So you couldn't go in and get around for your office colleagues. No. There had to be a half hour wait uh, between ordering. And it was done on a QR code. And then it went up to £25 and then it went up to 30 The company said it was a huge success. They then, to encourage you to sign up to it, they also gave you a discount on their wildly expensive food. Now, the problem was it was a QR code. There was nothing to stop you screenshotting that QR code and uh, spreading it around to perhaps on a family WhatsApp group. Now, I've written about this a couple of years ago, how I did it. And I actually told the chief executive, because I met him, you know, we're discussing various things. I said, everyone I know does this. Is this, is this not causing a problem? And he looked quite appalled and said, oh, no, no, it's a tiny, tiny amount. We can work out. People are doing it. Uh, and I said, well, if you put your prices down in your sandwiches, I'll actually buy one myself rather than sharing my wife's one. <laughs> well, two years later, they finally cracked down on this and you can no longer use the QR code. You have to actually download the app pro properly. You mm. can't share logins to the app. It's clever enough to know that you're on a different phone. So the problem is they put very strict security around this, uh, this, this app that you have to use. And lots of people have struggled over the last week or so. They've either been kicked out of the app or it takes them ages to get into the app. It's caused queues and chaos and people are upset. However, is Pret's future secure or is Pret likely to really suffer as a result of this annoyance? Well, I think a small number of people who are rinsing uh, the, the deal, the £30 for more or less unlimited uh, hot drinks, I think a handful of them will just never go back into Pret. You know, they did possibly abuse the system, but they also went in and bought the sandwiches uh, and the other stuff because that, you know, was, that was the whole point of the app. It was to mm. encourage you to come along uh, into the shops. I think they will iron out this problem. They will make the app less troublesome. Uh, they will throw money at improving the technology and the majority of customers will grumble along. But I think the problem is, Pret used to be known for incredible customer service. You know, it was an exemplar on the high street. The staff were fantastic. And one of the reasons was, was that they were encouraged. They were paid bonuses for being happy and smiley and occasionally being allowed to give away a free drink. 
and they replaced all that with this subscription thing. It's become just like any other chain on the high street. It's digital. You know, it's lost the human touch. So I think the glory days of PrEP will never quite return. Harry, thank you very much indeed. Good to have you on the programme. Coming up after the break, we'll take a first look at the Duchess of Sussex's brand, American Riviera Orchard. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. But you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss it. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family, and if any police officer reads that statement. If you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Meghan Markle's officially launched her new lifestyle brand, American Riviera Orchard, by sending jars of strawberry jam to influencers across the UK. Joining me to discuss this now, Royal Commentators Emily Andrews and Afia Hagen. Good to see you both. Uh, let's start with you, Emily. I mean, jam can be one of the most um, uh, economically unchallenging products available. In other words, it can be really cheap. You get a really good jar of jam at a supermarket near you for something like £1.50. I was very much enjoying, Vanessa, how are you describing <laughs> Meghan Markle's inaugural product? I mean, look, jam may be cheap to produce, but this is no ordinary jam. This is Montecito jam. This is American Riviera Orchard Jam. <laughs> and there are only, if we go by the pictures posted on Instagram of Megan's friends, 50 jars available in the world at this moment. And she has sent them to some of her friends who have posted on Instagram. Um, Tracy Robbins, who is the wife of Paramount boss uh, Brian, and also the wife of Nacho Figueras, of Prince Harry's um, good pal Delfina. They've posted these pictures on Instagram saying this yummy strawberry jam is delicious. 
and um, I'm sure it will be the first of many products that Megan will roll out. And Afia, we still don't know, do we, how much Megan's thinking of charging for the delicious strawberry jam? You're absolutely right. Now, it probably won't be £1.50, uh, but we do not know how much she's going to charge for jam or any of the other products, of the crockery, of the oven gloves, the bird baths, anything else that's involved uh, in this line of kind of lifestyle and homewares that she's releasing. We've got no idea, but I don't think it will be particularly cheap because it is American Riviera Orchard. Now, these particular, this particular batch that's come out, probably priceless because there's only 50 of them ever made and they've all been numbered sort of on the jars. But the ones that go into mass production, who knows what they're going to charge. But we did hear last week that she is going to do that cooking show, cooking, lifestyle, friendship, that kind of thing. We could probably expect to see some of the jam being featured in that. And whispers say that that is actually going to start filming this week possibly tomorrow, but not in her Montecito home. Exactly. Emily, that's exactly what I was going to ask Emily next. So the film is going to take place and you think you want, you know, essence of Sussex. So you want to see, you know, her cushions and her light switches and her door hands, or am I just talking about myself here? You know, you want to see the kind of the gaff, don't you? What's going on there? Um, but I understand it's going to be in a pretend house in Montecito that isn't really their house. What a shame. I know, we're all, especially the three of us, Vanessa, we're Got devastated. It. We want more glimpses of yeah. the Sussex gaff. I want to see those 16 bathrooms. I want to be able to count them. Me too. I want to see the four bits, <laughs> as the Americans call them, the taps. Are they gold? Um, no, we've seen a little bit of um, House Sussex, um, their obviously uh, multi-million dollar home in Montecito because they filmed some of the Netflix Harry and Meghan um, series there. But I suspect after that experience, that's why Netflix have hired a home house uh, location in Montecito so that Meghan can film the cookery show there. It, I mean, it's interesting, really, because when I saw the promo video for American Riviera Orchard, honestly, it's still such a mouthful, um, <laughs> on Meghan's Instagram, I actually thought that was her kitchen because when I reported initially on them buying that house I found the uh, real estate details um, it was available online and it did look the, the video that I, I thought it was actually her kitchen yeah. so it'll be interesting as to whether that actually was the show kitchen or whether the that was her actual kitchen and they've hired somewhere completely different but I think uh, look I don't blame Megan and Harry I reckon actually. that was they've the kitchen double children. that's why I think that was not the real kitchen but the kitchen double uh, ladies thank you very much indeed well I'm joined now by my exquisite colleagues Daisy McAndrew JJ Annecy and Ian Collins, lovely to see you Hello. all three. Tell me what's coming up on the talk today. Well, we're we, going to jam, jam Megan, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've got James Max's jam. No way. Okay. Yeah. What flavour do we know? Max, Max has, has been... been he's, he's been in a kitchen. This came, came from B&Q slightly. Like, <laughs> yeah. Still a he made it. I mean, you can get a good made, jam for £1.50 from your well, local well, supermarket. Well, we, 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 we'll get to taste the jam. Uh -huh. So, I mean, the jam could be horrific. We don't know. more on the show than just the jam. Jam. Because I'm already... The whole out. show. Out. The whole show is building up. just to the denouement. You have different spreads. Sandwich spread, some peanut butter. You're going through the whole lot, right? The full gamut. Oh, yum. Delish. Anything else? Yes. What else are we talking about? Secretary saying we should ban trans women from female sports. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm for it. And there's no jam in that story. It's a bit of a no-brainer, though, that one, isn't it, surely? Oh, all right. It's better than jam, mate. <laughs> well, Sharon Davis has spent a great deal of time... She's being very angry ...roundly about trolled about that, hasn't yeah, yeah. she? Indeed. All right, looking forward to hearing about that. Very sadly, we've now come to the end of the show. The talk is coming up straight after. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please do join me at the same time tomorrow. Lots of love and good night. Republic of Mike Graham. Weeknights at 8 on Talk TV.
Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. I mean, there's quite a lot of game playing going on here. Oh, don't start me on that. <laughs> there's a sort of feeling they ought to look as if they're doing something. So don't accuse anyone else of stoking culture wars. Such is the smoke and mirrors of, of politics. Ruminating and fulminating and debating and voting and God knows what. They said they couldn't back the party's position. But the government has got to be more flexible. It's starting to sound like a very expensive show, this, but anyway. <laughs> <it's not. laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Oi, 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 treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Whirl -missing. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth 